Hello again and welcome to another one of these video demos. I'm going to show you guys how I do concept art from start to finish on a on a, a character design. This is a Metal Gear Solid fan piece. Uh, disclaimers, I do not at the time of this uh, video have anything to do with anything official regarding Metal Gear Solid. This is all theoretical stuff. I love this game and I thought I'd cook up character concept art for it. So let's let's get to it. Let's see. Let's take a dip into how I, I put all this stuff together. Another disclaimer I want to throw out there real quick is that um, I'm going to be throwing out all kinds of information about like past Metal Gear games. I'm a junkie for this game. Uh, so I don't want to ruin the experience for anybody. If, if you don't like get into theoretical Metal Gear lore, then you might want to just switch off the audio. Because yeah, I'm going to be talking about the drawing process, but um, or the concept art process, but I'm also going to be talking about the history of, of some of the characters and, and, and why the designs are shaping what this character design is. Now, originally, uh, if you played the Shadow Moses incident, which was later remade as the Twin Snakes, um, if you played that, that game, then you'd be familiar with a character named Gray Fox. Well, Gray Fox was also part of Outer Heaven, which was kind of like a... It was Big Boss's uh, uh, Military Sons Frontiers. It was the military without borders. It was, uh, it was basically one of the first PMCs, in a sense. And uh, it was basically... They didn't want to fight for ideologies of a nation. They wanted to fight for what they believed in. Um, but whatever the case, so there was a dude named uh, Frank Yeager and he was codenamed Gray Fox. He was the only guy who had ever been named Fox. Um, and essentially he was this ultimate badass. And he went in under orders of Big Boss. This was at a weird time when like we weren't sure who was a good guy, who was a bad guy. Ideologies got mixed up and confused. So Gray Fox was an agent for Foxhound, and he was a badass, so they named him Gray Fox. Um, basically, he went in, and he kind of, I don't want to say he flubbed it. From my understanding is that he basically, um, he got captured, uh, but he was, he was actually working for Big Boss all along. Now, as Solid Snake, that would mean you're an opposing force. So Solid Snake, in a sense, was fighting this terrorist organization known as Outer Heaven, or the Military Sons Frontier. Anyway, long story short, uh, at some point Snake had to fight uh, Gray Fox. Gray Fox gets his ass handed to him because Solid Snake is a clone of Big Boss. And uh, so he's uber badass. And he's also like, you know, 24 or something like this. I actually don't know how old he was, but he was a young guy. It was one of his first missions. And so, you know, he kicks Gray Fox's ass. And if you watched the, um, the trailer for The Phantom Pain, uh, there's a moment, this is all my theory, like, I believe that there's a moment where Master Miller looks over at the doctors while in the very beginning, Big Boss is in a coma. They just say, all right, he's in a coma. Uh, Master Miller looks over and he says, what about him? And you look at the camera and the guy kind of looks over his shoulder a little bit. Now, Kojima said that's him, but that's not the case. I don't believe that's true. I believe it's actually Frank Yeager. I believe that Frank Yeager was part of the uh, the the... Um, the outer heaven, the whole thing, when, when all that went down and in the trailer you can kind of see where outer heaven was getting blown up and actually I think I believe that this will be the first time we actually see Solid Snake appear uh, in the, you know, actually interacting with, with Big Boss as in a sense like a remake of what we had played before back in 1985 where you were playing as Solid Snake infiltrating outer heaven. I believe that you're going to be playing as Big Boss in this game while some dude from Foxhound, you know, which is your former unit, basically infiltrates your base and you're in you're you're basically trying to just survive this thing so my theory is that that's frank yeager in in the uh on the gurney when master miller looks over and says how's he gonna how's he doing i'm thinking that's i'm thinking that's gray fox now what happened to gray fox he got his ass handed to him by solid snake in zanzibar land they turned him into a cyborg ninja okay that was dr clark dr clark who was paramedic in snake year Okay, she was experimenting with genome projects, the, the next generation special forces, or next generation, uh, 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 what's it called? Anyway, it was, there was genetic experimentation going on, uh, cyborg ninja experimentation going on. All this was happening right around the time that uh, Ground Zeroes and the Phantom Pain would have been happening. Well, there was actually about a 10-year span there, but that's why he was in a coma for nine years. 
So my theory is, and let's actually get down to all that stuff kind of shaped this character design. Now I believe that in traditional Metal Gear Solid uh, 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 style, there are echoes from historical things that had happened in previous games before. And when Gray Fox gets turned into a cyborg ninja by Dr. Clark, well, she would have had previous experiments. And so that's what this character is. I don't have a name for her, but I'm kind of building her with this mindset that she would have been kind of a, a mid 80s, late 70s, well, I guess it would have been, yeah, early, early 80s kind of uh, mechanical design. It might be a little bit more advanced than it should be. Um, and some of that is because in the Metal Gear universe, you know, you're talking about science fiction for its time. So it's interesting to do concept art for a science fiction for a time that's already gone by. But if you look at movies like Terminator, for instance, that would give you an idea of the way that people thought about what sci-fi would be in the late 80s. You know, what would be really super high tech and futuristic for that period of time. So I've got some Terminator influence going on here with this kind of cyborg technology, but I'm integrating the kind of shape language and uh, materials and even right down to the buckles that were used in uh, Peace Walker and the uh, uh, the Snake Eater game. So um, that's that's why you're kind of seeing some things like, uh, you know, some of the, the materials, there's actual like uh, uh, kind of leather work worked into it. I still wanted to give her, I wanted her to not feel as advanced as Gray Fox's Cyborg Ninja exoskeleton, because with her, it would have been maybe a larger part of her body was destroyed, and so she had to be sort of strapped together. She was using, uh, she was uh, maybe damaged. Maybe she was a former unit of Foxhound as well, and uh, one of Dr. Clark's earliest experiments. Uh, if you're familiar with the series, you'd know that uh, Raiden was also, uh, he, was, he went beyond uh, exoskeleton. He was, he was actually, I think, full-on cyborg, except for a couple of his major organs. Um, but that was way later. That was like 30 years later. So I was actually trying to think in terms of what would technology have been like in the early days. And it would have been kind of clunky. You'd still see exposed uh, hydraulics and things like that. Uh, I thought it'd be really cool to give her, in, in the, the sort of the theme of the cyborg ninja kind of a thing, to give her uh, these retractable uh, arm blades uh, that she could just rip things to pieces. And I wanted to do something different. Um, the, the cool thing about doing concept art for a existing franchise is that you have all this cool groundwork to go upon. You know, so historically, Whenever we've seen the Cyborg Ninja, whether it was uh, Gray Fox or whether it was Olga in, in Sons of Liberty, there were some consistencies. The faceplate was fairly consistent, the singular eye in the center of the face. Um, they always had a, a blade. In, in some cases, it became like a high-frequency blade that would you know, kind of cut through anything. And, and a lot of the, the coolest thing about Metal Gear is that yes, it's fantastical. Like it's it's completely impossible, but it's just believable enough. So you've got these characters that are constructed out of metal, and and you've got characters that, that have uh, uh, psychic powers, uh, able to control people's mind, hack people's minds, uh, make them do things. Uh, these these are impossibilities, but they're the universe is so grounded in kind of a science fiction or a, a, the way that, that good science fiction is written, I believe is very heavily based on real world logic. Um, and so uh, oh, one thing about this part, I, I kind of felt like her legs were looking a little flimsy. And you can see there's also some of the design echoes Volgan's costume design from uh, Snake Eater. And that was intentional. I, uh, at one point I put a, uh, a XOF uh, logo on her shoulder, and that's also theoretical. <laughs> My thinking is that uh, so Zero, during the Snake Eater mission, he started the Foxhound unit, but uh, at some point, uh, Zero and Big Boss kind of have a parting of ways, and I believe that when we see the trailers and we see XOF in the new uh, Phantom Pain and Metal Gear Solid Five videos, I think that what we're seeing is this is. Um, this is Zero's counter Fox unit 
And I believe that this would have been the early stages of the uh, development of the Patriots. And the Patriots are these like super uh, organized. Uh, they're the villain of the series. If you've been keeping up with it, they're they're like the um, the the the, the bad guys that are kind of um, controlling information. They're sending in. Uh, um, they're basically they're the ones that are te that tend to be trying to control the military uh, economy. Uh, you know, uh, starting up PMCs and funding. You know, whichever side keeps their their war economy going because it's all they've known. And all of these things were diverged from original thoughts that the boss, who was Big Boss's mentor had kind of expressed during the snake eater incident um, and, and before things that she had talked about. Um, and uh, so zero, I believe he started XOF and that would have meant that Dr. Clark or paramedic would have gone with him. And that's why I gave this, this character an XOF uh, a logo on her shoulder. But uh, here you can see him kind of working out uh, now in reality, if I were, if I were really designing this character for a next generation, title, I think that I would probably have a lot more detail going into, specifically into the breakdowns of the, the, the neck piece, like how does that metal part kind of wrap around the, uh, the jugular part, the inner thighs, there's sort of this implication of hydraulics and, and uh, tendons, but I think that uh, I would have definitely, yeah, if this were actually, you know, for real, for realsies, I'd, uh, I jump in there and, and actually detail the hell out of that because these days, I mean, if you look at the Phantom Pain stuff, it's super high detailed, um, when, and that's the downside of doing um, something science fiction or something that requires like creation versus photorealism. Now, I think that they they made some good decisions. I'm not cr usually crazy about photorealism in games, which is weird that I love Metal Gear so much, but I think that for what that is, it's necessary. So they're able to generate content extremely rapidly using this kind of a technique. But when it comes to creating mechanical design, creating, um, you know, fictitious elements to their universe, the science fiction elements, the, the things that aren't real already, you know, uh, if you wanted to design a, um, an experimental Jeep theorizing that in 1978 or whatever year, you know, they had this level of technology and this is the way they thought about uh, fuel efficiency, this is the way they thought about transmissions, this is the way they thought about construction of, um, of a vehicle, then you could theorize in those terms and that allows you the, the kind of the, the proper constraints to create something that doesn't exist within a realm that does. I don't know if that makes sense. But it's part of the, the the thing that's really cool about what Metal Gear Solid is, because it is kind of grounded in um, in history, but it deviates from history enough that it's not uh, it's not limited by it. It allows for the creativity. It allows for cool fiction to happen within this uh, uh, ex existing history and universe. Uh, here I'm kind of adding uh, just some interesting shape elements to the shoulder pads because I feel like she should be sleek. Um, I can imagine her like just doing crazy flips and somersaults and uh, kicking off of walls and just slicing through all kinds of stuff with, with her arm blades. Um, I wanted to break down just a little bit on the boot design uh, down here. Um, so, but she was looking a little too sleek and, and too uh, just form fitting. I never like a design that just looks like a pattern drawn on a, a human body. Like it needs to have. Um, the shapes coming out of it that give it a little bit more identity. And her gesture also implies a little bit more about her character. Uh, here I'm kind of working out the, um, the basic larger shapes involved in the, uh, the spine and, and how that would connect. I think the spine would be very integral uh, to a character like this because, you know, um, uh, that would be where all the more of the detail I think would go into um, the spine and probably like the, the neck area. Um, and then it's, it's important when you're doing a design to think about the larger shapes that are going to be the immediate read, the first thing that you see, um, and then allow, that that gives your eye a space to, to breathe, sort of, so to speak, uh, a, a place to rest your eye, a place where your mind can gravitate to. If you have characters, and this is a danger with next generation, uh, or I'm sorry, 
the, the, yeah, the next gen kind of uh, game development is that it's so easy to get out of control with detail, you know, but uh, control detail uh, where it's not just overkill on your eyes with just crazy detail everywhere. Control detail, I think, is essential. Uh, uh, logical, rational uh, thinking in your design. Um, you know, proper usage of suspension of disbelief within your character designs. I think all those things are, are going to become a lot more important necessary, you know, than, than not necessarily just more detail. You know, uh, sometimes if you look at some of the, the new trailers that are coming out, it's just stacks and stacks of weird stuff, you know, piled on top of each other. That doesn't make a better design. More, more detail doesn't make a better design. A good design uh, emphasizes gameplay or tells a story or communicates, uh, has, a, has a quick and easy read. Ideally, all of the above, and there's probably a lot more <laughs> that I could, I could go on about. But um, anyway, so I jumped ahead. You're not going to see me finish this and add color because I did that on a different computer. And that about does it. See, it's easy. Anybody can do this stuff. Uh, anyway, this is one of my longer videos. It's a bit of work to do these. Uh, if you like it, please subscribe, comment, share it around. Much appreciated. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.